All right. So here we are. We're in Acts chapter number five. And, I, you know, I love the book of Acts. Acts is my favorite book of the whole Bible. The book of Acts, if you think about it, Acts is just the actions. It's the actions that the apostles, the disciples did after you have, you know, the New Testament starts off. We got the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it kind of goes in chronological order in a sense where each one is a record of Jesus Christ and his life and his ministry and everything that happened. And they all end essentially with his death and his resurrection. Then in the book of Acts, we start off right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it leads into you know, Jesus Christ meeting with them, you know, they receive, end up receiving a great commission at the end of the book, you know, in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark, they receive this great commission from Jesus Christ, and then they're going to receive further instruction. They receive that instruction in Acts chapter one, and then they go off and uh, start working for the Lord. And the reason why I love is the book of Acts is because it's exciting. You see a church, you see people who love God, you see people who have been with Jesus now are going out and doing work. And I think one of the problems we have in churches in general today is people become way too complacent. People choose to you know, end up going to church as more of a social club or a social event or somewhere where maybe you go down, feel good, get your little pick-me-up for the week, and then just go back to your regular life and nothing's really different. And unfortunately, too many people treat their Christianity and just segment it off as if, well, this is something that I do on Sundays, but it's not part of who you actually are. We need to be more like the disciples and the disciples are trying to be like Jesus. We need to be more like Jesus. What did Jesus come here to do? He came here to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came with a mission. Jesus came to do work. Jesus worked day and night for the entire span of his ministry. He left us an example of how we should be. In the book of Acts, we see not only a lot of work being done, but a lot of opposition as well. It's not going to be easy. Now, thank God that salvation is easy. Thank God that he loves us, that, that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross, to pay for all of our sins, you know, paid 100% and offers our salvation as a free gift. We don't have to go out and do work and try to convert people to Jesus and do all this other stuff in order to be saved. He's just giving us that free gift. He's saying, this is bought and paid for already and I want you to have it because I love you. That's the gospel news. That's the good news that God loves you. He wants you to be saved. And all you have to do is put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and He will save your soul and give you eternal life as a free gift. No works involved at all. But after that, after that moment, you still have the rest of your life to live out. Now, that's the moment a person is born again. You become a child of God. You are born into God's family. You need to learn instruction. Get what God wants you to do. Read the Bible. Hear from Him the same way that a child needs to hear from their parents and be instructed on what they need to do. We need to listen to what God has to do and then do it. I mean, if you're, if you're thankful for your salvation today, if you, if you really care about the fact that God has saved your soul, for those of you that have put your trust in Jesus Christ, why don't you show it? Let's not put God up on a shelf or just put our Christianity, our belief just, just over here and we're just going to show up to church and then that's good enough. I mean, like, what is that? Is that really, you know... God the Father was able to give a sacrifice of His only begotten Son for you. And, you know, some people act like it's such a big deal that you've taken one or two hours out of your week to just show up to church and to hear somebody else teach you from the Bible. That's not good enough. Now, it doesn't mean you're unsaved. It's not going to have an impact on your salvation, but... If I were God, I wouldn't be very happy with my, with my son or my daughter, or my child, just showing me that level of respect when I've done everything for them and given them everything, given them eternal life, forgiven them of their sins. And all they can do is just muster up an hour or two of their time to just show their face somewhere where other people are doing the work for them. 
Jesus Christ, when he came to this world, he came here, he said, I came not to uh, be ministered unto, but to minister. He came to do the work of a servant. He came to serve other people. He didn't come to be served. He's coming back. He's going to rule and reign. And he will be the king and people will be serving him. That is coming. But when he came here the first time, when he came to die for our sins, he also came to leave us an example. And that's why he washed his disciples' feet. He came and took on the most humble jobs to show us, hey, you're, if Jesus Christ can do these things, then you can do these things. If Jesus Christ isn't too good to get his hands dirty, to do work, to work day in and day out, then you're not either. Nobody is above doing the work that God has called for all of us to do. And this is a church that you may feel uncomfortable from time to time. This isn't just a place where you're going to get a pat on the back every week and just say, everything you're doing is just fine. Just keep on doing what you're doing and never hear anything negative, never hear anything wrong. Because that's not how the Bible's laid out. We're going to preach the Bible. We're all sinners. But here's the thing. If you love God, you're going to want to try to get right with him. And the purpose of our preaching here and the purpose of coming here is, is to try to, to edify one another and to provoke one another unto love and to good works. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, we're here to provoke one another to love and to good works. We want to do what's right. We want to do what's good. Now we've been doing, and this is one of the reasons why we've been doing challenges as a church. So every church, there's a different focal point in our spiritual life, in our walk with God, something that we want to focus on improving and pushing ourselves to do even more. I think a bare minimum in general for, for your average believer, you ought to be praying every day, reading your Bible every day, and going to church every week. Those are my standards. Okay, you can look in the scripture and see what you think is appropriate, what God's going to expect of you. And I think those are just bare minimums. I don't think that's asking too much to hear a little bit from God every day by reading his word. I don't think that's very much to ask to communicate back with God through prayer and just and, and stay in touch with him, you know, on a daily basis, your heavenly father. I don't think that's asking very much. And then to show up and, and to help other people and to care about other people and pray for other people and love other people and learn in church. That's not asking a whole lot. I think there's a lot more for us to do, but I think I take that as kind of a bare minimum. But one of the things we do as a church is we take these challenges. So, for example, in the month of January, we had a Bible reading challenge where we wanted to push ourselves even further. Yeah, I think everybody should be reading the Bible every day, but how much are you actually reading, right? I mean, not everyone's investing a lot of time into it. So our challenge, our push was to read the entire New Testament just in the month of January. So that's 31 days to cover, you know, the, the whole New Testament, which is probably, it would end up being a little bit more, I think, than most people were spending reading the Bible. Now, I understand you could never keep up a, a, a push level on every aspect of your life all the time. You can't be going, you know, full speed in all areas all the time. There's simply just not enough time in the day. But what we're trying to do, especially with these challenges, we're trying to change our behaviors and identify areas in our life where we can say, you know, I really don't need to do this. We're, so you have your regular schedule. We're all creatures of habit. You get into routines. You, you wake up. You do whatever you do for the day. You go to bed and you kind of repeat every day. Well, the challenges are going to force you to make some adjustments to your schedule. If you normally only read the Bible for two minutes a day, well, that's not going to cut it if you're trying to read the entire New Testament in a month. So you're going to have to figure out, well, how am I going to make this fit? How am I going to make this work? And what it does is you start putting priority on spiritual things, on things of God. So we've had that one. We had the baptism challenge where we're focused on, hey, this is important. People need to get baptized. We had a prayer challenge where there's a, a certain amount of time every single day just spending in prayer, praying for other people. And this month, we're inviting people to church, trying to, trying to compel people to come in, that God's house might be filled, and just, 
just going out and, and obviously we're always preaching the gospel. I preached an entire sermon on this, but the, the, one of the focal points is just trying to bring people in, trying to get people, maybe, maybe people haven't been in church for a long time. You need to get back in. I was, you know, I've explaining this recently, you know, the importance of just being in church is extremely important. It's extremely important. I felt it personally in my life. I've witnessed this. I've seen it in other people's lives. They have spiritual growth coming, not just hearing teaching and preaching, but being around other like-minded believers is extremely important to be in church. So that's why we have one of these challenges of just inviting people to church, which leads me into our challenge for the month of June. Because June 1st is coming up on Saturday. And we have a challenge that is going to require daily activity in order to meet the goal of our challenge. Now, we started off here in Acts chapter number five. I want to point you to, you know, throughout this whole chapter, you've got people preaching the gospel and then being um, persecuted and even being put in prison and being beaten just for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jump down there to the very end of Acts chapter 5. Look at verse number 41. The Bible says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer, suffer shame for his name. So when the disciples were released, because they were put in prison, and in verse 40 it says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. So not only were they thrown in prison, but they were beaten. And it's easy to read over words like that sometimes without even thinking about it. But imagine what it would be like. Thank God we still currently live in a, in a country, in a nation, that you aren't going to expect this to happen. At least not yet. Where we can freely exercise preaching the gospel and going out and talking to people and engaging them and telling them about Jesus Christ. That was not the case when the disciples were walking around and they were being persecuted. And you know what? Yes, they ended up being persecuted by Romans, but at first they were being persecuted by the Jews. Their own people didn't want them teaching about Jesus Christ. And that's who it was here. They were brought before the Pharisees and these counselors and these, and these men in power that ended up arresting them, beating them. But what was their attitude like? Did that make them stop? No, it was actually the exact opposite. Instead of, instead of making them stop, because they, they said, you can't do this anymore. You got to stop preaching in Jesus' name. And then they have them beat. Then they're like, get out of here. And when they leave, instead of being upset and scared and putting their tail between their legs and running home going, I don't want to have anything more to do with this Jesus stuff. I don't want to tell anyone about it. This gets me in too much trouble. You know, people are looking at me as a, as a lawbreaker now and, and, and people might not want to hang out with me anymore and, and not have company with me anymore because, because I'm getting arrested and beaten up. You know, what are you doing to get beat up? I'm just preaching Jesus. They didn't have a bad attitude. In, in fact, what they did was they rejoiced. Imagine getting beaten up and throwing, thrown in prison and being happy about it. But this is the attitude that we see in many more stories than just right here. In the book of Acts, start reading through it and you'll see, wow, why are they, why are they rejoicing? Why is it so good to them? It says that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They say, well, if Jesus is our example, look at the shame and the humiliation and what Jesus Christ suffered when he was crucified on the cross the name calling, the spitting on him, the getting beat up and whipped and tortured and hung on a cross. Well, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. That's the, that was their outlook. I say, well, hey, if Jesus can do this, and he did it, it wasn't in vain, right? The, the purpose for him doing that wasn't in vain. If you're getting beat up and thrown in prison for his name, for what he did, that's not in vain either. There, are, there is going to be opposition. That's a fact. And you, you, if you're going to go into this, and if you're going to make a decision to say, you know what, I don't just want to be the Christian that just shows up to church every once in a while and, and that's it and just live the rest of my life like the rest of the world does. But if you actually want to start doing something for God, you've got to realize there will be opposition. It's not going to be easy. Now, you may not be getting beaten up and thrown in jail, at least not yet, thankfully. 
Thank God for that. But there's always going to be opposition. There is an enemy. Satan is real. The devils are real. And they're going to be opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are not going to want you to be preaching. So there is going to be opposition. It comes in many forms. So you just have to be prepared for that. But I want to focus on this last verse here, verse number 42. This is after they got released from prison and got beat up. It says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They continued to preach Jesus, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ daily. This wasn't every day. This wasn't a once a day. This wasn't once a week. This wasn't once a month. This was, this was every single day, daily in the temple and in every house. So they were going out and making sure that everybody heard this news. And you know what? It makes sense. When you receive the best gift that you could ever receive in the whole world, forgiveness of your sins, eternal life with, with Jesus Christ, with God, and, and completely being saved from an eternal punishment of hell, why? And, and, and you understand that that gift is available to everybody? It's not just a single solitary gift that only you can have, but everybody is capable of receiving this gift. Why wouldn't you want to tell other people about that gift? Well, there's plenty of reasons why people don't. People might look at me funny. Oh, it might upset them if I bring up religion. Oh, I can't, you know, I don't want to do it. You know what that says? A any of those excuses ultimately just say you don't love that person. If you're not willing to show someone, I mean, think about this. There's a great, and there's so many great analogies to understand this concept. Let's put it into, because it's, it's hard sometimes, I think, for people to wrap their minds around an eternal, burning, fiery pit of hell. Because you don't see it when you wake up. You, don't, you can't walk, you know, drive by the store and be like, oh, there's hell. So it's not part of your regular consciousness. You're not thinking about that all the time. But a good way of thinking about it is just imagine someone's house, imagine your neighbor's house burning down. You see the flames coming out of the house and you know that your neighbor's in there and they're asleep. Maybe they're deaf. Maybe they have some other problem and they, they're, for whatever reason, they're not going to know that their house is on fire. Now, you could go, well, it's two o'clock in the morning. They're probably, they need to get their rest, Right. I don't want to bother them. If I wake them up, I might upset them. They might, they might get a little angry at me for pounding on their door, you know, in the middle of the night. I think they'd be happy to hear about that. Now, obviously, this is, this is never a perfect correlation when it comes to, to soul winning, when it comes to trying to lead people to Christ. But you get the idea, because what we're trying to do when you bring up Jesus Christ, when you, when you preach the gospel to people, is you're trying to warn them Hey, your soul is headed to hell. It's like they're in this burning building. And you're just trying to save them out of that, out of that pit, out of that house. And, you know, you can't force anybody to do anything. But all you can do is show them the truth. Let them realize, look, you, you are headed towards damnation. You are headed towards hell. And you need to be saved. If you know someone's going to hell and you don't tell them how to be saved, you don't love that person. I mean, that's the bottom line. You cannot say you love somebody and not explain how, to, how they can avoid that torture and torment. There is no love there. This should be one of the main motivations for preaching the gospel to people is just understanding and realizing. I mean, if you actually, I, I actually believe, it. I believe hell's a real place. And I believe there's going to be many people that are going there because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that, that um, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto, unto life and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. Now, why is it straight and narrow? It's straight and narrow mean the same thing because it's only through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. It's not through any other God. It's not through living a good life. It's not through how well you do and doing good unto others. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's only through faith in his name. It's the only way people can be saved. And it's narrow. And few, unfortunately, few people find it. And I think one of the reasons why few people find it is because so few people have already found it are willing to show other people 
how to find it. Too many people are content just sitting back and going, well, I'm saved. I guess the whole world can go to hell, but, but you're saved, right? It's a bad attitude. It's a rotten attitude. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Just flip back a couple pages. So, the challenge for our church for the month of June, just as we saw in Acts 5.42, daily in the temple and every house I cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ, every single day of the month of June, the challenge is to attempt to give the gospel to at least one person every single day. Every single day. Being a daily soul winner. Having that on your mind, on your heart, every single day this is the goal is that we would always be thinking about this all the time because it's that important that it should be at least in your mind there have been so many opportunities in the past that i've missed to preach the gospel to someone simply because it just wasn't even a thought to me i could think back on my life just going back from the time i was saved until you know until today just times where I've had great opportunities. I've had one-on-one -on -one time with somebody, some, either an old friend or just some other person, anybody, where, wow, that would have been perfect. We had plenty of time. There was no rush. And the gospel never came up. And I, and I was pretty confident they were unsaved. And just the gospel never came up. Why? Because it didn't even cross my mind. And that's a shame. That's sad. That's sorry. That, that, that's shame on me for allowing those those, uh, those times to pass because who knows what a day is going to bring. We have a tendency to fall back on, oh yeah, well, I'll just do it another day. You never know what's going to happen to your friend, to your family member, to, to someone that you love especially, or to anybody. You don't know what a day is going to bring. They could be here today and gone tomorrow. And that is one thing. If there's anything in the world that you, you don't want to screw up, it's it's giving somebody the gospel, giving them the opportunity to be saved because once they're gone, it's over. There is no second chances. When someone passes away, their chance, their opportunity to get saved is gone. If they were not saved, nothing else can help them. No amount of prayers after the fact. Jesus isn't going to meet them after they die and say, well, do you want to accept me now? There are no do-overs. It doesn't work like that. That is not found in Scripture. That is a lie that is taught in many churches that, well, I just think that, you know, if people didn't really hear the gospel, that they're going to have an opportunity even after they die. No, you know, it's a lie. It's a lie to just comfort people who are not doing the work that God has given us to do. The Bible says that God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation that we are to be ambassadors for Christ, reconciling people to God in Christ's stead. Christ isn't walking around this earth anymore, so he's entrusted us with the gospel, with the gospel of truth, with the gospel of love. The gospel is able to save people's souls. That is our job. He's entrusted us with that. So if people are, are dying and going to hell because they didn't hear the gospel, then shame on us. We're not doing our job. God did his job. Jesus did his job. That's done. Now the job is on us just to show people how to be saved, to, to give them the word of God, to show them God's love from the scripture. It's our job to do that. And I think we need to be thinking about this on a daily basis. So the challenge is you don't have to give the whole gospel even for the, for this for the rules of this challenge. You don't have to go through the whole plan of salvation with somebody. You don't have to keep talking to people until you're able to do that. Sometimes you're not even able to do that in hours and hours and hours worth of time on a given day. So it's the attempt needs to be made. You have to breach the subject. You have to go up to somebody and approach them, whether it be knocking on their door or at the store or anywhere in your daily life, just attend, just ask them and just at least ask them the question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And attempt to start the conversation if if they shut you down you've met the 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 the, the uh, rules for our challenge but the goal is to be thinking about this regularly and, and just to be approaching people and breaching the subject that's it's a very simple rules but it needs to be done every single day so um, i understand look i've i've worked long hours 
But the good thing is, is that in our society, even if you work weird hours or long hours, there's always a gas station open somewhere. And there's always people either walking around or working. If it's that dead that nobody's around there, you've got somebody sitting behind the counter. There's 24 hour Walmarts. There's, you know, I mean, you get creative and you find somebody if you need to, you need to talk to someone because you've got a weird schedule. Because I don't recommend knocking on people's doors in the middle of the night or anything like that. Obviously, I was using an illustration, but that's not, you know, that's not going to be the best way to lead somebody to Christ because they're not going to see it the same way that you see it. Even though it is that important, you know, we still show respect to people uh, out on the door. I'm not going to get into all that, but use common sense when it comes to that. Talk to people if it's late. Talk to people who are already out. You know, don't, don't go to houses. And for this challenge, you could call people on the phone. Talk to someone. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, literally live in person. But the goal is to be giving the gospel to at least one person every single day. So that is the challenge. Push yourself to do a little bit more. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, we're just going to see a few more verses about this daily work. And this wasn't just a challenge for them. This is what they did, by the way. This was life for them. We're, it is a challenge for us. We're reading about people who did this anyways. Acts chapter 2, look at verse 46. The Bible says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. People are being saved daily. Daily they're meeting in the temple. Daily people are getting saved. Daily people are being added to the church. This was a work being done daily. Matthew, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read for you from Matthew 26. Matthew 26, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's being arrested, right? They come to arrest Jesus. Here's what he answers them with. It says, In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? He's saying, Why are you showing up in the middle of the night in this garden and you got all your weapons and your swords and you're ready to, to just aggressively arrest me now? He says, I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. He said, I was with you every day. You saw me on a daily basis. But look at what he says. Daily. Daily he was teaching. Day, every single day he was out there teaching. Second Timothy chapter 2, we'll look at verse number 21. In order to be a daily soul winner, someone who's going to be thinking about preaching the gospel to someone, getting people saved, this has to be in your mind first and foremost, but you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So in the context of referring to a man you know, purging himself from sins, getting, getting sin out of his life, in order to be a vessel unto honor. Because the Bible says here, you know what, I'm just going to turn there to explain this further. Because this ties in perfectly with the point that I was making about people who are believers, people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saved, but they're not really doing any work for God. See, some people will have the false teaching that will say, oh, well, if you're not doing anything, then you really weren't saved to begin with. That's not true. That's not a true statement. God knows the heart. The only thing that's required for salvation is to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and after that, you've got a battle every day between the flesh and between the spirit to either do what's right or not to do what's right. You can walk in your flesh and still be saved because God has saved your soul. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 19, we'll start reading there. The Bible says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this sealed. The Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows who are his. God knows the hearts. God knows who's trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't always know that. The best we can do is just go off of what a person says. If a person says all of their faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to take them at their word. I'm a prime example of this. When I was younger, I got saved when I was 20 years old. 
but I was not living the Christian life or a good life for many years. If you were just to look at me out in a bar, living a wicked lifestyle, you're going to say, that's not a Christian. And you'd be right. I wasn't actually following Christ, but I was saved. I wasn't a disciple. I wasn't doing the work. I wasn't doing anything for God. I was living in sin. But God had already saved my soul. And no one could tell me otherwise. I know that I know that God saved my soul because the Bible says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you know what? I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ when I was 20 years old. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I called on God to save my soul and he did it because he's faithful and true to his promises that he makes. He promises that it's not of works lest any man should boast. I didn't do any works. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. He saved my soul. I had eternal life when I was 20. I have eternal life today. I'm going to have eternal life forever because it's eternal, because it lasts forever. So the Bible says, The Lord knoweth them that are his, in verse number 19, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to depart from iniquity. He wants us to get the sin out of our life. It says, But in a great house, God's house is a great house. There's, there are you know, people in his house that are saved. It says, There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. He said, When you have a big house... Not everybody's going to be that shiny gold and silver that's really valuable. You're going to have other things in that house as well that, that aren't quite as honorable. And in God's family, in God's house of born-again believers, you've got the gold and the silver, the people doing all the works and, and, and getting sin out of their life and, and trying to be a vessel unto honor. And then you've got a lot of other people that are actually dishonoring God dishonoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was one of those vessels. Being a dishonor and dragging Jesus' name through the mud, if I'm supposed to be here representing him, yet I'm going off and committing all manner of sin, that's a dishonor. This is why we need to change. This is one of the reasons. Let's show God our appreciation. Let's be a vessel unto honor. It says, and if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If you want to be a good vessel, we need to be prepared unto every good work. And the best work that you can do is to show other people how to be saved. That is the best work that a person can do. So in order to do that, we need to be prepared. So how are you going to be prepared to do this work? Number one, you need to get Bible verses memorized. You need to commit Bible verses to heart. Now we just, you know, as a church, we're going through the whole chapter of the Second Thessalonians chapter two, and that's great. And I encourage people to memorize as much Bible as you can. But if you haven't memorized scripture before, start with soul winning verse. Start with John three sixteen. John 3.16 is great. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Easy verse to memorize just because you probably heard it so many times. Start with that. Start having this. The reason why I say it's so important to memorize the Bible is because if you want to be used of God and you want to be prepared on every good work, what happens if your Bible isn't with you? How are you going to give somebody the gospel? The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's word is what brings forth the life in a person when they're born again. It's not your words. It's not my words. So right now I'm trying to explain and help expound upon God's word, but my words don't bring forth life, but God's word does. Faith cometh by hearing. You can't believe in something you haven't heard but hearing by the word of God. You put your faith in God's word. I don't believe, I didn't put all my faith in Jesus Christ because some man told me to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I have my faith in Jesus Christ because God's word says that. That's, that's ultimately that what brought forth that life 
is it comes directly from God's word. That's where the power is. That's where the life giving is. So this is why it's so important and why I stress memorizing scripture, memorizing Bible, because if you're going to tell somebody about Jesus, yeah, you could tell them the overall story, but your words aren't going to have the power that God's word has in order to bring forth that new life. So memorize passages like John 3, 16 or Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is God's words. Those are not my words. So when you tell someone, hey, this is what the Bible says, that's going to allow them to be able to get saved because they could hear, well, that's what God is saying. I'm going to believe what God is saying. That's what gets a soul saved. So if you want to be prepared to be a daily soul winner, someone that's able to go out and just in any situation be able to preach the gospel, you need to have these verses memorized. And I would also make a point as far as being prepared is do whatever you can to bring a Bible with you. Now, these days, it's really easy to do because most people don't go anywhere without their phones. And you could download a Bible app and have that with you anywhere you go. Thank God for the, you know, making it even easier to have this stuff. They're free. You don't even have to pay any money for it. Download it on your phone. And if you always have your phone with you, then you could always have God's word with you. That's, I'm all for it. I love the Bibles, the physical pages and stuff. But hey, if you can have that with you on your phone, great. Praise God. That's good. It's with you. Use it. Be prepared. Remember that it's there. Don't be like, oh, well, I don't know. I don't have my Bible with me. It's on your phone. Use it. Be prepared. Have the verses memorized. Uh, flip over to Acts chapter 8. We're going to see a couple stories here. Philip was someone who was ready to give the gospel at all times. Other disciples were people who were ready to give the gospel at all times. That's why they're doing this daily. But in order to get to that point, you need to study up and put forth the effort in the work to get to that point because not you don't just you don't get saved and then you just start off automatically just just be like super christian ready to do everything on a daily basis it takes some time it takes some effort to get to get everything ready to go um however you can you can put yourself out there and go out so i'm not saying that you have to wait before you go out and try to preach the gospel to people i mean if you look at the woman at the, the story of the woman at the well Jesus Christ was giving the gospel unto her. And when she realized that he was the Christ, what's the first thing she did? She dropped her bucket. She dropped what she was doing right there and went into town and said, hey, isn't this Jesus? And she started pointing people to Jesus Christ, which is what we're doing when we preach the gospel. We're pointing people to Jesus. We're pointing people to the Savior saying, hey, he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He can save your soul. So right off the bat, and she was effective at it. Now, if you want to be better at persuading people and showing them the truth, then you need to keep practicing. But the most important thing is just start doing it. Get involved. Start today. And the, the, the more you prepare, the better it's going to be, the easier it's going to be, and um, the better results you're going to get just for being prepared, for having, you know, being meat for the master's use. Have these, uh, these scriptures memorized. Look at Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse number 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So God is speaking to Philip through the Holy Ghost and just tell him, Hey, go over here. And Philip's going, Okay. So he arose and went, verse 27, And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. So Philip doesn't even know where he's going. He's just being led by the spirit. He said, okay, you want me to go over here? Fine, I'll go over here. And then the spirit's going, hey, look, there's a chariot over there. Why don't you go and join yourself to that guy and start talking to him? Okay, so he shows up and it says, and Philip ran thither to him. He didn't drag his feet. He wasn't grudging, going, oh, man, I got to go talk to this guy. Oh, you probably want me to talk about Jesus, don't you? No, he ran to meet him. He was excited. Say, great, hey, there's somebody out in the desert there. I'm going to go join myself to him. He ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet's eyes and said, understandest thou what thou readest? 
and right away he's able to lead into giving him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he does in this story. He gives him, the, he preaches unto him Jesus Christ. And then the guy goes, hey, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? So Philip says, well, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And, he, and they stopped the chariot and he, and he baptized him. So uh, he ends up leading this person to Christ. This person wasn't going to get it on his own. This person's there reading the Bible. He's trying. He's seeking. He wants to know what the truth is, but he couldn't get it on his own. He needed Philip to show him. And that's the way that lost people are today. Every lost person needs somebody to help show them the scripture and explain it to them so they can understand how to be saved. The Bible says that we all have ministers by whom we've believed. Everybody. The Bible, you know, in Romans chapter 10, who I've already quoted from, you could turn there if you'd like. I just want to prove, I like to prove all things as much as possible. I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 10. It's just after the book of Acts, the book of Romans. The Bible says in verse number 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That sounds really easy, and you know what? It is really easy. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then it tells us how that's going to happen. Because it doesn't just happen on its own. It does not just happen on its own. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? They're saying, first of all, there's no way someone could call on the Lord, at least legitimately, the way that the Bible's talking about calling on the name of the Lord in order to be saved. Obviously, people can say words all day long. But in order for someone to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, he's saying, how can they call on the name, on, on, the name on him whom they have not believed? So You've got to believe. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? It's impossible to believe in something you haven't heard of before. It's impossible for people to believe salvation is a free gift if you haven't even heard that before. And how shall they hear without a preacher? So they need to hear it. How are they going to hear it? By a preacher. And how shall they preach except they be sent? People aren't just voluntarily, just on their own, in general, getting up and just, and just going and, and preaching the gospel. The reason why people go and preach the gospel is because they've heard it. They've been taught it from somebody else. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This gives us the outline of, of how a person gets saved and what's required. They need to call on the name of the Lord. How are they going to call on the name of the Lord? Well, they need to believe on Him. How are they going to believe on Him? Well, they need to, they need to hear the gospel. How are they going to hear the gospel? Well, it needs to be preached unto them. Well, how is it going to be preached unto them? Well, someone needs to be sent to preach the gospel unto them. That's the formula. That's the way that it works. That's one of the important reasons of going to church because you know what we're going to do here? We're going to send you out to preach the gospel to people. And we're going to help instruct you and teach you how to do that. Come along with us this afternoon. You've never been before. Join us. Whatever plans you've made for this afternoon, why don't you come on out and, and join us and you don't even have to do anything. All you have to do is show up. We'll do all the work. You can watch one of our soul winners, someone who's already been doing this, is already comfortable with this. You can see how we go through the gospel, how we go through the plan of salvation that God has in his holy word. Just come along with us. We, we won't, you know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to open up your mouth. But it's important to understand how to show people how to be saved. It's very simple. It's not complicated. But it's important. Because if people aren't doing this, then people aren't getting saved. It's a bottom line. We're in Romans 10 there. Look at verse number 20. In addition to memorizing Scripture and being prepared, we also need to have boldness. And this is probably one of the number one reasons why a lot of people don't go out and preach the gospel is this lack of boldness. Because it does require some boldness to, to approach somebody you never knew. I'll be honest with you, I was terrified of walking up to a door and knocking on it. Some stranger, I don't know who this person is. Terrified. I mean, this was like 
probably one of my worst nightmares is, is having to do something like that. I'm a computer person. That's, that's what I do. I have another job outside of pastoring a church. I'm a computer programmer. Okay, I am not anymore your typical computer person, but I was. I was way more introverted before I yielded myself to God to allow God to work in me to do whatever it is that he wants me to do. To, to bring me to the point to even be able to stand in front of a whole group of people and speak out loud. I used to be at the point to where if I had to stand in front of people, I would physically get ill. My stomach would turn into knots and I would buckle over in pain because I really didn't want to be in front of anybody. This is just, this is me. This is who I was. Okay, so I understand where people are coming from. I understand what it's like to be deathly afraid of doing something like this. But everybody has to make the choice for themselves and say, is this what God's word is commanding me to do? And then you have to decide, well, if God's commanding me to do this, am I going to do it or am I going to be disobedient? Yeah. What am I going to do with that? Am I just going to reject what God is telling me to do? Hey, I was on the receiving end of the gospel. Someone else had to give me the gospel. I was able to hear from God's word how to be saved. And I received that free gift. Now am I just going to take that and not return the favor to somebody else? It didn't sit right with me. But here's the great thing. The power isn't in you. The fear is in you. You have to overcome the fear. But the power isn't really of you anyways. I was able to lead a person to Christ not because of my good speaking ability or talents or anything like that, especially when I first got started. I dropped my Bible on the ground. I'm kind of stuttering and stammering and, and not doing a very good job. Yet a person was still able to get saved. Why? Because the power isn't mine. Because they heard the word of God. God's able to use anybody and everybody to preach his word if you're willing. If you're willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me. I'm here. I'm not good. I'm not able to speak. Even Moses, he had the same problem. He was saying, God, I, I, can't, I can't speak well, God. I don't think I could do this. He had doubts. But is anyone going to deny what a great man of God Moses was? Of course not. Great man of God. But, but he had the same type of fears. But the bottom line is we need to overcome those fears. And see, at first... He needed Aaron there with him. But you know what we see over time? He didn't need Aaron to be the mouthpiece anymore. Yep. Once he got started doing it, all of a sudden it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal anymore. He didn't have to rely on Aaron. Come along with us. We're, we'll be the mouthpiece for you when we go out soul winning and you'll realize once you start doing something, it'll make your fears go away. You realize, oh, that really wasn't that bad. Oh, the people aren't just tearing your head off for knocking on their door. Yeah, occasionally you get someone who's a little bit rude and they don't, you know, they, they don't want you there. But you know what? For the most part, the vast majority of times, even when people aren't interested, it's not a big deal. They say, no, thanks. Okay, have a good day and move on. It's the fear of the unknown is really what, what paralyzes people. Get over that enough just to, just to do it once. Do it a couple times. See what you think. And I guarantee you it's going to get a lot easier. Yeah. Guaranteed. And not just that, pray. So in Romans 10, I'm sorry, I, I didn't even get to this verse yet. Verse number 20. The Bible says, but Isaiah is very bold. Isaiah is very bold. He says, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Isaiah was bold. He went out and sought people. They're not seeking him. They're not looking to hear the gospel. They're not looking to hear from God's word. But he went out and talked to them anyways. And I saw, he sought them out. They weren't seeking him. And this is what the Bible's teaching that we need to do too. Look, not everyone's going to, you know, you can't just wait for someone to show up to church 
in order for them to hear the gospel. We need to be bold and to be found of them that sought us not. Because there are a lot of people out there that don't even realize. There's a lot of people out there that don't even realize they have a problem and that they're going, they're going to go to hell when they die. A lot of people don't even realize that. They think everything's good. That's why we need to show them from God's word that, because if, and if, if a person doesn't think that there's a problem, then why would they even come to church? Why would they even bother seeking anything if they don't think there's a problem? We need to show people, hey, look, there is a problem. As a sinner, you deserve to go to hell. But there's good news. God's offering forgiveness for all of your sins. That's our job. Let's look at... Um, Turn, just uh, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to try to wrap this up here real quickly. I'm going to read you for, for, from Acts chapter 4 while you're turning to Ephesians chapter 6. Acts chapter 4, verse 29, the Bible reads, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. What we see here is people praying unto God for boldness. So if one of your problems is not having the boldness to, to preach the gospel to people, or you're worried about what they might say or do, pray to God to give you boldness. That is the solution without fail every single time. In Scripture, we see people praying unto God. In verse 29 of Acts chapter 4, and now, Lord, behold their threatening. See how they're threatening us. So they have a reason to be scared because they're being threatened. They're being threatened with, with physical harm. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They're saying, even in that face of opposition, give us the boldness that we need. By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. You pray unto God, God fills you with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost gives you that boldness. That's what we need. Ephesians chapter 6, we're basically going to see the same exact thing here. In Ephesians 6, verse number 18, the Bible says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So this is talking about praying always, praying for other people, praying for supplication, praying for all the saints, praying for other believers. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is the Apostle Paul asking the Ephesians, asking the church at Ephesus to pray for him. Say, pray for everyone, pray for the saints, and pray for me. The Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist probably of all time, is asking a church to pray for him. Well, for what? For more boldness. He's saying, pray for me that I may open my mouth boldly. <clears throat> no one is immune to this. But we need to have that boldness in order to preach the gospel. He says, I may open up my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He's saying, pray for me for this, because I need it. I need the boldness. He's, I mean, here's a guy that's in jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, asking for more boldness to continue to preach Jesus Christ. Why? Because you don't want to get burned out. You don't want people to, to just get you out of the fight. And when you reach opposition, don't let that stop you. You know, maybe you have a bad experience with somebody a family member or a friend or someone at the door and, you know, it, it just doesn't go well at all. You may end up getting people who don't want to talk to you ever again because you bring up the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you have to understand that's not you that they're rejecting. If they're going to reject you because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you could actually be glad about that and as a partaker in Jesus' suffering. Because all you're trying to do is show someone good news because you love them and because you care about them. If they reject you because they reject Jesus, well, a lot of people have rejected Jesus. That doesn't make it still not your job anymore. It's still our job. And... and it, you could at least say, well, I tried. 
You didn't just sit by and do nothing while they're on their way to hell. You can't force anybody, but if they're going to make that decision, then they're going to make that decision. Last place we'll look, Acts chapter 17. We're talking about the importance of being a daily soul winner, and that's our challenge for the month of June, is to attempt, at least attempt to give the gospel to one person every day. In order to do this, it needs to be in your heart. It needs to be in your mind. You need to be thinking about it so you don't just forget and go, oh, wait, yeah, I need to do this. No, be thinking about it, and I guarantee you when you're thinking about it more often, when you're out at the store, when you're in areas, it's going to be less likely for you to lose great opportunities just because you weren't thinking about it. So we need to be thinking about giving the gospel to people not just at scheduled soul winning times, but all the time. Every opportunity you have, don't pass it up. And we're going to see one more example here from the Apostle Paul as a great example for us, as someone who was a daily, a daily soul winner, someone who thought about these things and preached these things every day. Look at verse number 16 of Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, so Paul's waiting for his friends to join him. He's at Athens. It says his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So he's there. He's waiting for his buddies. And all of a sudden he's looking around and going, wow, this city is just given over to idolatry. There's just idols all over the place. And that bothers him. Why does that bother him? Because these people are worshiping false gods because they're all going to die and go to hell because their faith isn't in the Lord. Their faith isn't in Jesus Christ. So that bothers him as it should bother all of us. When you're just surrounded by idolatry and stuff like this, it should vex your soul. It should bother you. It bothered him. It says, therefore, verse 17, so because it bothered him, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So anyone that would meet with them, he's like, they need to hear about Jesus. So he's going to the synagogues. He's going to the market. He's doing this daily. Why? Because there's idolatry all over the place. They're worshiping false gods. They need to hear this. Verse 18, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Again, just to further show, that he is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. That's what he's doing. He's preaching Jesus and the resurrection, and these people, they're lost. They, they still don't understand it. They're always oh, preaching new gods. Because they have a multiplicity of gods. And you're thinking, oh, well, here's some, some other new god. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Hey, he found people that were interested. He sees the idolatry. He decides, you know what? People just need to hear about this. So he's going to the synagogues. He's going to the market. Anyone that would meet with him. He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it gets to the point here where people are like, hey, we want to hear more about this. Tell us what you're talking about. It says, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Paul was prepared. One, his, his heart was for the people. But two, he was prepared to then be able to expound it to them and show them, hey, this is why you're wrong. Idolatry is wrong. But here's what Jesus Christ did for you. He preached a resurrection living savior this is something this is one of the most important challenges that we're doing as a church in my opinion because this is literally what our christian life is supposed to be about bringing other people to christ the main focal point of jesus christ's ministry was to seek and to save that which was lost he healed people. He did a lot of great works and miracles and wonders. But ultimately, the whole purpose of him even being born was to die on that cross to pay for our sins and to, and to be resurrected. That was the purpose of, of Jesus Christ coming to this earth. We have a purpose to reach other people with the message. Don't let Jesus's what he did, his sacrifice, be in vain to anybody. It's not in vain overall, but it is in vain for a person who's never heard the gospel. They don't even know. That should never happen. Let's not allow that to happen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the free gift of eternal life. Thank you for the great sacrifice that you've made, Lord. I pray that you please work in our hearts and our minds, not just to walk away today and just forget everything that we've heard from your words, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to um, change our life a little bit, change our schedule, maybe make somewhat of an inconvenience in our own daily life to, to serve you more, Lord, and to, and to do what you would have us to do and to love other people enough to, to preach the gospel unto them and show them how to be saved. God, it truly is the, the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life and everyone who's saved could probably say the same thing. The, the day that we got saved from an eternity of hell, Lord, we thank you for doing all the work for us, for providing that for us, and for sending ministers to, to preach the gospel to us. God, I pray that you please help us to reach other people and have love for people to, to tell them the good news on how they could be saved, Lord. Help our church to reach as many people as we possibly can. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.